Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for coming out to Lick Lake today. Um, this is Distilling in Motion, the Art of the Short Story. It's the second of three panels happening here today, and there'll be three more happening tomorrow. Uh, Lick Lake is a, an annual festival. Um, we're thrilled to get back in person for some of our events this year. We still have some online, and they go through the 23rd. I'd like to thank the Contemporary Jewish Museum and the Yerba Buena Community Benefit District, along with the California College of the Arts for presenting this event. And I'm also just gonna quickly thank our sponsors who sponsor the whole festival, and that includes Cal Humanities, Craig Newmark Philanthropies, Grants for the Arts, the Minor Anderson Family Foundation, the National Endowment for the Humanities, St. Joseph's Art Foundation, um, and I already said the Yerba Buena Community Benefit District. So um, tonight we're going, or today, this afternoon, <laughs> getting ahead of myself, we're going to hear from three great short story writers, moderated by a, a fourth great short story writer. Unfortunately, Brontes Purnell, it, through um, circumstances beyond his control, is not able to join us today. So um, hopefully you'll still check out his book, which is um, for sale <laughs> in, uh, in the bookstore. We're going to be hearing from the authors for an hour. We're going to take questions for 15 minutes. And then we'll all move to the bookstore where you can buy books. You can ask any questions that we didn't have time for. Um, and then you can also get your books signed over there. Uh, please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Fill out your surveys, which you probably already got at the door. And most of the festival is free. So we are always very welcoming of donations. That's how we survive. You can donate at our website, lakequake.org. You can donate at Venmo, which is at Lakequake, or on PayPal at info at um, I'm going to introduce our moderator for today, and then she's going to be introducing the other writers. <clears throat> Olga Zelberborg's English language debut, Like Water and Other Stories, explores bicultural identity hilariously, poignantly, according to the Moscow Times. Her writing has appeared in The Believer, Electric Literature, Lit Hub, Alaska Quarterly Review, and elsewhere. She's the author of four Russian language collections as well. And she serves as the co-facilitator of the San Francisco Writers Workshop. And she's a co-founder of Punctured Lines, a feminist blog about Russian and post-Soviet literature. So welcome to Olga and our other panelists today. <laughs> Thank you, Cecilia. Uh, sorry. <laughs> thank you, Elise, and thank you all of you for being here. Um, I love Litquake. It's 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 been amazing. I was a volunteer years ago and um, did other other uh, things, and it's just I love it. It's so great to be back. Um, so yeah, let me introduce our panelists, and I'll I'll introduce your bios first, and then I'll ask you to introduce your books. So first is Cecile Barlier. Uh, who was born in France and received her master's degree from the Sorbonne University in Paris. For over two decades, she has lived in the United States, where she's raising her family and working as an entrepreneur. Her short story collection, A Gypsy's Book of Revelations, won the 2019 Grace Paley Prize for short fiction, and two of her stories were nominated for the Pushcart. Um, all right, to my left is Grant. Grant Faulkner, uh, the executive director of National Novel Writing Month, NaNoWriMo, starting in November, and um, well, I guess next month, and um, the co-founder of 100 Word Story. He's the author of Fisher's a collection of 100 Word Stories, and his book that we're going to be talking about today is a collection, All the Comfort Sins Sin, All the Comfort Sin Can Provide. His essays on creativity have been published in the New York Times, Poets and Writers, Lit Hub, Writer's Digest, and The Writer. He also co-hosts Right-Minded, right a weekly podcast on writing and publishing, which you should all subscribe to because it's wonderful. Um, and uh, Ethel Rohan is the author of In the Event of Contact, winner of the Zeng book Dang Books Short Story Collection Prize and the 2021 Gold Ippy Award for Best Regional, Fi Re Regional Fiction Europe. Her debut novel, The Weight of Him, was a 2017 Amazon Bustle, Kobo, and San Francisco Chronicle Best Book. 
and was shortlisted for the Reading Women Award. Rowan is also the author of the short story collections Good Night Nobody and Cut Through the Bone, long listed for the Edge Hill Prize and the Story Prize, respectively. She's published widely, including the New York Times, World Literature Today, the Washington Post, Pan America, the Irish Times, Tin House, and Guernica. Uh, originally from Dublin, Ireland, Rohan lives in San Francisco. Uh, yes, and I, I will mention one more time that Brontes Purnell could not be here, but you should all buy his book. It's wonderful, as all of the other books on this panel are. Um, will you please tell us about the book and how it came to be? Sure, sure, I will. So I'm Cecile Barlier. And uh, I want to start by saying how thankful I am to, to be here in such great company in such an amazing venue. Uh, you know, Ethel, Grant, uh, Olga, um, I looked you up <laughs> and read some of your stuff. And I'm very impressed and very humbled to be here by, by your side. Uh, um, this book uh, is actually my first book. Uh, and uh, I was lucky enough to, to win the Grace Paley Award, to my surprise. Uh, and it's, the stories in the book are very eclectic uh, and very different. Uh, when uh, I wrote them over the span of about 10 years, I would say, and I didn't have in mind a collection as I did so uh, until you know I put them together and eventually uh, won this prize. Uh, I would say the stories are really uh, explorations, uh, explorations of the weirdness of the human experience. I think a lot of writers do that, but yeah, this is this is what I what I did. Uh, stories about. Uh, extreme stuff, extreme forms of love, um, adolescence and bodily transformations. Uh, there's a, a bit of magical realism because I think I, in general, find reality quite odd. Uh, so the, the magical for me is sort of a natural extension of, of my perception of the world. Uh, and um, on one note, I, I, and I know this kind of sounds weird, but I'm, I'm really grateful, uh, grateful to be here and to this country. I'm a migrant, uh, you know, like a, a lot of us, uh, probably a lot of us in this room. And uh, there, there's something really wonderful uh, about the experience that I've had. I'm a migrant by choice, so, so for me it was relatively comfortable an easy experience, but I have to say that what I've found here uh, has really lifted me up to, to, to be here, to start writing stories, uh, has given me uh, English as my toy language uh, um, that I, you know, write in my, to the dismay of my family. <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah, I want to I wanna just say that uh, that how grateful I am for, for to be here and and I think I could not have done that elsewhere. Uh, so uh, a lot of people have boosted me, helped me along the way and got me there to be here with you with this book. <laughs> Uh, and I should say, as a, as a second language writer myself, I completely relate to how writing in one second language can be totally liberating. So <laughs> here's an advert for studying languages. Um, <laughs> uh, Grant, what about your book? Yeah, well, thanks to Litquake. Um, Litquake is such an amazing literary festival. I think it's very unique to San Francisco. It couldn't have been formed anywhere else. And I say this in part because uh, National Novel Writing Month was also founded in 1999, the same year, and I don't think it could have been founded anywhere else. I think there's something about these like whimsical, organic movements that come from the streets. So anyway, it's wonderful to be here. And I got to say, it's a little bit intimidating to be here, because I haven't been on a panel since before the <laughs> pandemic. And so I feel like I'm just speaking for the first time and learning how to speak again. Um, but Olga, when you send an email out, um, telling us to introduce our book, something that's, I'm like, oh no, I don't want to do that. <laughs> um, you said we could read from the book. Please. And, and I have these tiny, tiny stories. I mean, most of this book, it's not about 
I have a book, like Olga said, a collection of 100 word stories called Fissures. There are some 100 word stories in this, but most of them are also more conventional length stories, or there's a mix of those, um, a mix of conventional length and flash fiction. And the reason I, I read this is that the title came from this little story called Morphine Drip. Um, and it's a 100 word story, it's the last story in the book. And just to give you some context for it, it's um, a son who's in a hospital room with his father who's dying and on a morphine drip and sort of, you know, as people do on morphine drips, talking and revealing things about his life. So, morphine drip. It's what we remember, he said, as if clinging to a frayed thread tossed to a man overboard in a storm, outside a few parked cars, inside a dim bluish light. Frogs croaking in the woods, gin rickies under an August moon, the violet night. He said something about a boy named Jim, his pants down to his ankles, his tuxedo shirt unbuttoned, long baby hairs on smooth cheeks. Never underestimate the comfort sin can provide, he said. A lifetime of bedtime stories all to your lonesome. Skin crinkled around his eyes, his dry lips pressed feebly around a straw. And so the reason I read that um, is that my friend Pamela Painter, when she read my collection Fissures, she highlighted that line, uh, the comfort that sin could provide. And she said, you ought to title a collection of short stories that. <laughs> <laughs> and so it all kind of, that was the light bulb for me, that this would be a kind of cohesive theme for a lot of the stories that I'd already written. Most of these stories were written before that moment. Um, but I'd say that the reason I liked it is because it posed a question of, of what comfort is there in misbehavior or sin. And so I think all these stories in some way sort of uh, ponder that. And I love the way it's both on the cover and it sort of bookends the stories. And so you kind of have the sense that, that the stories inside could be a part of, you know, a life, you know, or um, they're definitely, they've definitely become a part of my life as a reader, you know, mm -hmm. they, they become, uh, they feel very much a part of a whole uh, this way. Thank I, you. That's, there's a nice sense of return. Um, Ethel. Thank you. Um, I echo uh, Cecile and Grant's gratitude to Lithquake. Uh, this is my second time on the Art of the Short Story panel and I'm honored uh, to be invited back, thank you. Uh, my story collection, In the Event of Contact, is uh, 14 stories. Um, they mostly center, uh, echoing the title, In the Event of Contact, they center on stories around the necessity, absence, and trespass of contact in various forms. Uh, the stories are largely set in Ireland, um, which like Cecile, I was also quite surprised to, to win the Design Prize, <laughs> simply because I felt they weren't, um, you know, centered enough here in America. Uh, I was concerned about that, and I thought perhaps a better fit would be an Irish or a UK publisher. Uh, but to my delight, it did win the prize. It was published uh, just this past May. Uh, Grant and I were lamenting the timing. Unfortunately, it's a very <laughs> strange time uh, with COVID, et cetera, the pandemic. Um, and this also is my first live event in, in over two years. So um, I think we're all hoping we can rise <laughs> to the occasion for you and uh, make this a worthwhile hour. Well, and I hope that uh, by the end of the panel, you all will fall in love with these writers and these books as much as I did. They, these are very experienced writers and very daring, and I was really um, excited to see the range of creative risks they, t they took in their books. I read, I read the, well, all the books um, at, you know, close together, and I always love finding um, similar threads or similar themes between books. I, I, my, my mind uh, connects um, um, links together, and so um, I couldn't uh, help but notice that, so Grant and Ethel's books share uh, writing uh, stories written from the point of view of uh, the opposite gender, 
Um, and I, I noticed that, it, well, Ethel's and, Ethel and Cecile's story share some of the themes of moving to a different country and returning home after a prolonged absence. And other common themes in the books include death and love and sex work and sex workers, complex relationships to religion and priests, parents, <laughs> siblings, significant others, and there's racial and ethnic tensions and reverberations of colonialism. In other words, these stories uh, seem to me to speak very much to the current moment and uh, to all of us living in San Francisco specifically. So I'm going to ask um, each of you a question about uh, your book, and then we'll um, we'll do some of the more um, uh, across the board uh, t uh, questions. Um, so I'll, I'll start with Ethel uh, or Ethel. Sorry, I'm. Okay. <laughs> it's, right. For some reason, that's a hard name for me. For me. Uh, I get called Apple a lot, so <laughs> you're doing fine. <laughs> So yeah, um, there's so many interesting stories. I mean, you start with a story about uh, a, about triplets, one of whom uh, who doesn't like to be touched, and that creates hu horrible problems for the families. But one of the one of the maybe most unexpected voices for me in this collection was in the penultimate story. Uh, F is for something uh, about a priest in Ireland who's suffering from dementia and is expecting a visit from a bishop who who is. Uh, supposed to send him into retirement. And you know, it, the story struck me for several reasons. One is that the voice is so different from, or the, the character is, you know, seems really, really different from, uh, you know, uh, well, other stories in the book. And, um, uh, and also, uh, that you know, when I was thinking about the stories, that I realized that we often write about um, people with dementia as, uh, passive as receiving help. And what what was really interesting about this story is that it's very much from his point of view, and he's very active in it. He's con constantly striving. He's striving to remember. He's striving to convince the bishop to change his mind. Um, and it was really interesting um, perspective. So I was just wondering where uh, where did the story come for, for, uh, come for you, and what were the pieces that went into the creation of Father Quinlan's voice? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, interesting enough, uh, my collection also spanned a decade. Cecile, I think you said your stories yes. were about a decade, and um, App is for Something is actually the oldest story. Uh, I started it about 10 years ago. Uh, it was never published prior to um, this book coming out, and I, I think part of that was um, I was concerned, even, even as the author, even writing the story, I kept thinking the reader is going to expect, you know, in that first paragraph, um, I, I create a somewhat sense of suspense over why this priest is so anxious about this visit from the bishop. And I realized I needed to get it up fairly soon, what was going on, to clue the reader in as quickly as I could, because, of course, I immediately worried that they're going to think he's a pedophile. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a story about you know church abuse, um, which absolutely has its place. Um, but I was entering it in a way, in a more personal level, because my own mother had Alzheimer's. and you know, survived with it for a long, long time. Um, so I knew that experience really intimately, and I suppose that's interesting that you point out how much agency Father Quinlan has. I think, you know, we have so much control as authors, and we make various choices, and I very much wanted him to be an active character. I wanted to catch him in that moment of, um, you know, the horror of knowing I am losing my mind, I'm losing myself, I'm losing my identity. Um, and, you know, you think about at what point do I enter a story and what point do I get out of the story. And I, you know, he kind of came to me at that point. That was my, the spark that brought me into the story was him sitting at a table, the breakfast table, with a letter. And you know, then as the author, I'm, I'm asking questions of the story of the characters and of myself, of my own imagination. Well, who's the letter from? You know, what's, what's it about? Why is the bishop coming? Why is he being forced into retirement? So it's kind of like this interview process I have um, with my characters. And 
Yeah, just knowing that the story would be better if he has as much agency as possible despite his dementia, um, and just kind of taking it from there. It's interesting to hear that it took you t 10 years, or the this, this story was written 10 years ago. Uh, and just for the writers in the room, I'm just wondering, since uh, you said that it hasn't been published before this collection, that has it been collecting rejection letters? Or just, no, or actually, are you just not, uh, I mean, you... I can quite frankly say, I mean, I did yeah. send it out, but very little. Huh. Um, and I think I was just letting it stew, you know, even though I first wrote it, 10 years ago, it went through many, many, many drafts. And it was just a question. You know, I find endings incredibly hard. And you know, the short story form, yeah. you've got this really small, constricted space to work with. And you're trying to deliver, essentially, a story arc and a you know, satisfying narrative. And the endings are brutal. Um, and then you realize you've got to figure out everything. You know, everything's got to be right. Everything's got to be in service of the entire story. And that's ultimately how you arrive at the end. But they're difficult. Yeah. And the ending. The ending really worked very well, too, because you don't fully reveal the conversation with the bishop. It happens off stage, and there's a it's, it's really clever. It's, you, have to, you have to read it, and it's in this book. <laughs> that was a great sales. <laughs> Um, all right, Grant, so um, the, the story I, I picked out from, from your book, and the, the, there's so many amazing stories um, in all of these books, and I was just trying to, um, I, I'm, um, you know, I'm, uh, uh, this one uh, particularly struck me uh, because I found, uh, so uh, the story is called Mr. American, and I found it very, very deeply, uh, it's striking and it's really, really disturbing. So it begins with a sex scene between a man and a woman, and slowly we learn that the man is white from one of the most established, wealthiest families in town, and he's cheating on his wife, and the woman is a first or second generation lo uh, Laotian and um, from, from what she says, I'm from one of the three Laotian families in town. Um, and, and that she believes in love and truth. And things go immediately wrong in this relationship. Uh, and she kind of falls in love with him. And he ends up killing her. Uh, he le leaves her on the side of the road in winter and, and later learns that she died. Um, and the story is written uh, close to his perspective. And um, reading the story, I was really thinking about how you show us one of the forms colonialism really shows up in a small American town today. And, and also that Mr. American is really cl is as close to a completely redeemable human being as I've come up, um, as I've seen in recent fiction. Um, so I really want to hear you talk about how you, the story developed and um, what, you know, what, was it hard to revise and was it hard to make him quite as, you know, awful <laughs> as he mm -hmm. is? Um, or what was the hardest part to get right about this character? That's a good question. Um, the story actually, I'm trying to think of really, the, the roots of it actually go way back in my life. I grew up in this small town in Iowa in southeast Iowa, and um, there were three Laotian families in town, essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, there were essentially, I, f I forget the name of the tribe, but there are about 3,000 um, after the, all, all the stuff that happened after the Vietnam War in Laos. Um, this tribe, they, they wrote a letter to 30 governors of, in the, the US to see if they could come here and remain intact. And only one governor responded. It was the governor of Iowa. And so Iowa basically received 2,600 Laotian refugees sort of out of the blue in the mid-'70s. So I was in fifth grade, and, and my best friend was one of the, the Laotian refugees, even though he didn't speak English. You know, We played at recess. And um, they were this intriguing presence in the family or in, in, the, in my small town, which is kind of like a family also. That's the other dynamic that I think comes up in the story, or I hope it does. And so, um, so I've done a little bit of research on them. And, and um, most of the oceans are still there. And so it was interesting to me. That's why I didn't place the story in the mid-'70s when they came there, but in the mid-'90s. And I, but I started mainly with the, the, the main character, because growing up in this small town, 
I mean, like I said, it's, it's, it's like a family or it's like a little nation unto itself. And the people of privilege, um, it's amazing what they can get away with, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? And so if you've got especially multi-generational wealth, they are like the royal family in a way. They, or the families like that are like the royal family, that they can pretty much do anything with impunity. And so I, I put this guy in that situation that his life has always been about getting away with things. And I was thinking about the, what does it mean if you just get away with things kind of as a lifestyle? How, does that, how do you approach the world? And so he's this recovering alcoholic, and he hasn't had a drink in a year. And so on the day that he that hits the year mark, he goes into a bar to see if he can handle it. And then he meets this woman who's playing pool, and they go to this you know motel on the mm -hmm. on the edge of town. And he obviously doesn't succeed in in keeping his alcoholism at bay. Um, but yeah, it's all about that kind of recklessness of not having to take care of people. Like when when he pushes her out of the car, he doesn't even think about it being winter. He doesn't think about how, what she, it would be like to be abandoned on a country road, how she might not uh, feel comfortable going to a house and asking for help, you know, that she might not have a cell phone, all these things that he can't even think about because he's only thinking about his own getting out of the situation, essentially. And so that's what the story is about, really. It's about like how, and I think it did, you know, writing it in that small place. I'm glad you said all that you did about it because like when I reread it, reread it recently, I did realize how it spoke to a lot of the things we're reckoning with today as a culture. And um, yeah, I mean, it, it brought those issues to the fore. Another way to think about it is that this is a man who has no idea of his privileges as a white guy and he yeah. just drives away. Um, did did the, you write this is the what? So the main action of the story, he learns um, and ends, and he learns about her death. And then you have another coda, another section to the story where he goes into, you know, there's a little bit more time passes. He, go, he sort of recounts his events, and he, he completely justifies his behavior in his mind. Did, did that part of the story also appear at the time of your original draft, or did this come later in revision? Because uh, that, that part really also makes that story, because just the, seeing how one can make something happen, one can receive the news, oh, somebody died, and then completely go back and completely justify his original action in his own mind. I th thought that was really powerfully done there. Thank you so much, because I, I did, that was the part that I struggled with, was the mm -hmm. ending. I can't, I don't know how many <laughs> endings I wrote. I wrote many endings, and because I wanted to hit that note appropriately. You know, he had to, you know, how do you balance, like, finding out that you were, uh, he's not supposed to be a total villain either. He's supposed to be kind of a normal guy. He's just like, as you said, he's not aware of his own privilege. Um, so I, I, I think a lot of people, are unfortunately like human beings are wired to um, rationalize their, it's kind of the way that people keep living. They can rationalize a lot of really bad stuff. I think it's the rare person who has a true reckoning with something that they've done. And that is at the heart of his character is that he doesn't have that ability. He's always getting away with things so he doesn't have to reckon with things. I think he will in some way reckon with this, mm -hmm. but, but, it's, it's, but right now he's on that path of rationalization. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, it's, it was a really tough balance to strike, and I still don't know if I struck it, but thank you for, for saying that. Um, well, th thank you. Um, all right, I'll have a, I have a question for Cecile, and maybe, um, all right, maybe I'll, I'll ask you a follow-up question. But uh, the, the, the stories in this collection are really innovative uh, structurally, not only in, in the thematically, but also the, the way you, you uh, put each story together is so interesting. One of the pieces that struck me, and this is the uh, collection, uh, one of the pieces that struck me uh, in particular is called Wednesday of the Japanese Wave. And in this story, we have conversations between, I think, its granddaughter and grandmother. Uh, and there, there are many scenes connected to each other with subtitles, and the subtitles subtitles themselves create a narrative. Uh, it's sort of, yeah, yeah I, I don't have the appropriate me metaphor, like maybe like riding the, the wave, the, the, radio, the radio wave. Um, but it's, um, it's a really daring technique, and it, uh, it's really fun for the reader who gets to reconstruct the puzzle of the story. So I really wanted to ask you about how this, uh, how, 
yeah, how this came to you, and how how did how do you see, uh, yeah, how do you uh, how did you um, how basically how did you have the courage to yeah. <laughs> to to do something like this? Well, thank you so much. Uh, I think. You know, um, for me, stories are, you know, obviously explorations of, of characters and, 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 you know, Grant and Ethel, you mentioned how it's opening questions and exploring those questions and having that dialogue with your, with your, or that interrogation with your characters. Uh, and so, uh, so that's one way of exploring. Another way is also with form, because I think, uh, as short story writer, we have the privilege of being able to tap into uh, forms that would be unbearable in the long form. Uh, so we're sort of in between, you know, the poetry and the novel, and so we can take on and have fun with forms that are, you know, over the span of 10 pages, it's, it's delightful, but if you were to do this over 100, it would be horrendous. Uh, and so I, I get a lot of inspiration actually in poetry, because I think poetry, obviously, it's the magical kingdom of, of form, but we can do a little bit of that. Uh, and, and so that, I think, is extremely fun. So for me, the, the joy of, of writing and uh, writing in the short form is also that exploration. So b beyond the questions that I have with my characters, it's also the questions about form and what form allows you to do. So uh, in, 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 in the context of that story, so I, this is about my grandmother. This is a very, one of the most autobiographical story in the book. Uh, and I, she, she passed now uh, about 10 years ago. And uh, when she was dying, uh, she was very old. She was 96 when she passed. She was, she was really tired of living. And I don't know, I had this sense of urgency that I wanted to, to connect with her really quickly. Uh, uh, and, and so the, the way it came to me was like snippets. Uh, snippets of moments I had with her, um, you know, in her apartment. She lived in, in a little apartment in the Alps overlooking the lakes and the mountains. It was already quite magical, per se. It was super hot always, <laughs> so it was unbearable. Uh, and she, she was uh, sitting in, a, in an old uh, chair that could, like, form itself. It was bizarre. And I always thought of her as when she fell asleep, she looked like a Japanese wave about to crash. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and so hence the, 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 the name of the, the title of the story. Uh, and yeah, so I think I took insp inspiration in poetry for that particular format. I don't remember exactly what inspired it. But I loved the idea. It was very freeing to think in terms of snippets and then tie them with a snake uh, story that would snake around those snippets. And I just literally would brainstorm with myself, like, what are the 10 things that you can tell me about grandma? Uh, and what are the 10 moments that make your heart beat? And, and, and so it was, really, it, was, it was really wonderful. And I could tie moments that were totally unrelated uh, when I was super little and sleeping in our bedroom and listening to her snore. Uh, and then she is super old and in diapers and now I have to take care of her. Like this, this old reversion of, of life was really uh, interesting and very, uh, you know, moving but also really delightful for me to explore. Uh, so, uh, but also it makes it a little bit inaccessible. My husband was pissed at me when I wrote this. It's like, this is really, I can't read this. Uh, so, uh, so yes. Well, it's it, it does. This is I think this is where yeah the the, the non writerly readers can have very, very little patience with creativity. But it is really wonderful to um, to 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 get in there and to try to reconstruct what is happening. What was the, um, 
what was the, the, the line that went through the subtitles, or where did that, or those, those sentences, what the, the, the sentence? snake? Yeah, the snake <laughs> sentence, yeah. Uh, well, the snake the, sentence yeah. sort of yeah. uh, grew mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> with, the, with the snippets. Ah, uh, and then I, you know, I wanted to, t I think I, I felt connected to her, um, the last moments and the last mm -hmm. weeks and the last month were just difficult. She was she was tired of living. It was too much, and I was not able to help other than you know be here and listen to that struggle of being very old and just tired. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think that the snake. Um, sort of grew out of that sentiment. Yeah. Oh. Wow. It's, re it's really effective. And I love your thought about how form is another way to explore um, the, char the characters and the relationships. It's, it's a, it, I re it really resonates. Um, thank you. Um, I'll, um, so one of, one, um, in, in reading all of the, the four books uh, together, there's one theme that, and it was a, um, yeah, it was a, uh, well, one th theme basically that uh, I did find in all four books, which which <laughs> I was really excited about uh, because it's a fun. It's well, it's fun or yeah, I don't know what to make of it. It's well, the theme is infidelity. Uh, <laughs> it's fun. It's fun for. It's, <laughs> Depends on which side yeah, of it you're on. <laughs> it's right. It's it's fun, I guess, for the fiction writer who likes to make connections between books. That 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 was <laughs> the fun part of it. Um, but. Um, yeah, so um, the theme, um, all, all, I think all books touch on infidelity. In Cecile's books, the character does, doesn't get to have the, <laughs> the, 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 yes, the prize, and uh, she's making a pass at a, at a, uh, at a, um, like a, a, a Catholic priest, right? And, the, but things don't, don't work out in her favor <laughs> um, in that story. But um, I'd love to talk, uh, about infidelity as an element of the short story form, is there something about infidelity that right now seems to be particularly suited for the short story form? So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was just thinking about. I mean, this. I'll throw this out. It's it's a thesis that you know can be very easily debunked. I'm sure, but you know, I feel like. You know that the infidelity was the big thing on, of the novels of the 19th century. It was, mm -hmm. you know, like so so much. You know, we can all think about. Uh, but I almost feel like today writing a big novel about infidelity wouldn't wouldn't hold Seems up. It's just, it's, yeah, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's like okay, it's just too commonplace somehow. But but for short stories, it just really seems to help uh, writers uh, do other things. <laughs> um, so I don't, I don't know if you have any thoughts or how does how does how does that that particular sin come come, come into play in in your uh, for you or where did yeah where where did those stories come from? Um, I'll yeah. Go for it. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll try. <laughs> yeah. Um, so so it's two part question. So the first part, um, you know, is the short story form well suited yeah. to the theme of infidelity, and. I would actually say no, interesting <laughs> enough, because I think with any theme, the short story, as I mentioned earlier, it is, it, it's shorter, right? <laughs> You've got less room to do, you know, you can do less with less space. Um, and so something as big as infidelity, you can think, oh, how can I can even take that on? But everything is in the moments, in the details. Um, like I'm thinking of that movie, Love Actually, um, that, that holiday Christmas movie, and it's got all these you know, various characters and storylines going on. And Emma Thompson plays the character of the betrayed wife. Her husband, Alan, played by Alan Rickman, is unfaithful to her. And there's just that one moment where she finds the Christmas gift she thought was intended for her, and it's actually intended for Alan Rickman's lover. And it's super, super short. And what she pulls off in those couple of minutes in the bedroom is incredible. It stayed with me, you know, all this time. And so I think that's the objective, uh, you know, of the writer to, to capture that moment in all its complexity and depth and regardless of the form. 
you know, so be it the novel, whatever else, that's, you're always trying to get to the emotional truth and to make it as vivid and visceral as possible. And so I think ultimately my thought is the short story form makes it more difficult. You know, you've got to do more with less. <laughs> um, but that's the challenge. You know, I love the short story because it is just so damn difficult. <laughs> um, and, and it's mysterious. You know, there's mystery to it, like any art form and writing in particular. You know, I, I sort of come out of the fog afterwards and think, you know, how did I do that when I eventually have a story that I feel is finished? You know, you do step away and sort of feel like, you know, you mentioned magic, yeah. Cecile. Like, there, there is an element of magic to it. Um, and then why does uh, infidelity show up? I think you're particularly thinking of my second story, yeah. Into the West, in the collection. No one was more surprised than I that I had a protagonist who was male and who was uh, you know, unfaithful to his wife and, and, and had a history of being unfaithful in relationships. And um, I think for me, it was figuring out, you know, why this character, why this story, why now, uh, why me, you know, why, why did we kind of come together? And I just knew he wasn't an asshole. Like, I, I didn't want to <laughs> spend time with an asshole, um, not in my precious imaginary world, you know, <laughs> why, why would I do that? So it, so it was that interrogation, that investigation of who is he and why. I'm always fascinated by why, why, why. Um, and the bigger, you know, infidelity is, is, is <laughs> it's part of betrayal. And I think, you know, we're all draw from life. We all draw from our, uh, you know, emotional experiences and, uh, I've never had an unfaithful partner, but I had a childhood and a young adulthood that was very much marked by betrayal, by you know, very close relationships. Um, so that's going to stay. You know, that's imprinted. And whether I choose it or not, it's always in some form going to keep showing up in, in my work. Thank you. Other, other <laughs> thoughts? <laughs> I don't know. Oh, I was going to say, I, I think I'm, I'm just going to counter what Ethel said just for the sake of the panel. Yeah. Um, but, uh, well, one thing when you were talking, I was thinking, I was trying to remember this Robert has quote from his poem. I don't, I'm going to butcher it, so you can Google it. But I think he says, it's the poem Meditation at Lagunitas. Um, he either describes longing or love, or, or love or desire as longing across distances. So I was thinking of the paradox of that, to your point about like, does is the short story kind of the perfect form for infidelity? Because before I came here, this is where I was going to disagree with Ethel. I, th I thought yes, because I think infidelity for me, it's it's about containment, right? It's about all these like little secret spaces that people go in their lives, um, and I think a lot a lot of infidelity happens in short periods of time. You know, I think in the novels that you're talking about, they like mm -hmm. they pondered infidelity for two or three hundred pages <laughs> be before like writing the note. You know, and and so like there was a luxuriousness to infidelity, whereas now I think it happens quicker and in whatever more more dramatic sort of bursts, um, or that's how I imagine. Imagine it. Um, cough, cough. <laughs> yeah. But I do think there is something about the longing across distances mm -hmm. that you can interpret however you want. You know, it could be longing across mm -hmm. distances, the paradox is that in a very small, short space, or it could be a long, whatever, mm -hmm. lifetime of space. Um, and you know what? I was talking with an, with an author once, uh, Kim McGowan, who's a local flash fiction mm -hmm. author who writes a lot of stories. Um, you know, with infidelity in them. And she's like, I'm always being asked, am I like betraying my husband? And she's like, no, I just love <laughs> the topic of infidelity. And I think like it's a, it's, you know, yeah. I can think of no better topic for a writer. I mean, you've got, it's very efficient. You've got like betrayal, secrets, desire, you know, um, yearning, all these things all in one. It's just such a, it, you know, it, it, story ignition point or whatever. Um, and so I think I, like Kim, it, it's just like I can naturally go there, or I go there a lot for stories, just because I think it crystallizes people's um, sort of existential malaise. Like when I was talking about my small town, one of my jokes about the small town I grew up in is that people uh, are very contained and cooped up, but they're very restless and they're yearning a lot. And so it all just like makes for a lot of drama. So they're <laughs> in this small space where it's really hard to keep secrets. <laughs> they're doing all these crazy things. So. Yeah, so that's why I like writing about it. Yeah, so I think I, 
so I don't know. Mm -hmm. I guess I'm in the middle of both of you now. I, I think it, infidelity is a cool topic for all the reasons that you, you mentioned, uh, Grant. It's like there's secrecy, there's anger, there's betrayal, there's revenge, uh, there's containment. Uh, I mean, it's loaded. Uh, and so where there's loads of tension, there's loads of opportunity for story, right? <laughs> so that's kind of awesome. Uh, and I was thinking, you, you know, you, you sent us some of your questions before, yeah. so we have time to prepare. <laughs> uh, and I was thinking, you know, I don't think I explore it that much in my stories other than the one story that you, you <laughs> mentioned, which is a, a very pregnant la lady who is trying to seduce uh, a young uh, priest-to-be who is in a seminary. So that's an interesting dynamic. And um, but I think other than that, I, I didn't really have it that much. But then I think, well, what is really infidelity? And uh, maybe infidelity, other than just you know being in the context of adultery, maybe infidelity is also about breaking exclusivity, uh, and 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 what that sparks, and all the questions that that come with it. And so I was thinking, so maybe my, my gypsy in my title mm -hmm. story, she's infidel to her tribe because she asked a non-gypsy to go to her funeral and read to her children. And uh, maybe the mother who forgets her son on a, in a road trip is infidel to her motherly duties. I mean, there's all kinds of ways in which you can be infidel, unfaithful, uh, I mean, outside of just uh, adultery. And I think that's really cool. Uh, to to explore, uh, so maybe it's the, the, that act of, of breaking the exclusivity that that matters, and and maybe a short story does just that, break the exclusive idea we have about this or that, and and it makes us infidel in the best way, uh, you know, makes us less exclusive. I love that answer. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's it's, it's all. I do kind of. I relate to that as a reader because once you, uh, the, the, with the experience of reading a short story collection, because you, you, if you fall in love with a character and then you're asked to part with them and turn to the next page and change completely your yes. idea about uh, <laughs> about the not only the the. Um, narrator and the story and the time and place, but also about the implied author. The, we will now learn that, oh, the, implied, the, the author whom we're, you know, whom we're reading is capable of this whole entire other universe. And I'm not sure I'm prepared to go with her there. Um, so I, I often feel sometimes, uh, leaving the stories that I really enjoyed, uh, that you know, I'm breaking some kind of a bond that I've just established. So that's really interesting. So and um, uh, I also want to ask, um, uh, so, uh, I, I want to ask my question uh, about cultural expectations. I think uh, this is this to me is a very interesting uh, topic, and um, uh, we we uh, often talk about short stories in general as though they're a kind of a universal that there is a universal form of the short story, um, and uh, as though people. Uh, yeah, people uh, writing stories in Ireland, France, uh, Russia, US, uh, and New York, uh, uh, Iowa, and San Francisco, um, as though we, we are all uh, expecting the story to perform in the same way and to deliver us the exact same thing um, as, as the story from a different, that coming from a different geographical place, but also racial and ethnic background. Um, so what do you think about this? Does, does your cultural, racial, ethnic background affect the way uh, your story unfolds beginning, middle, and end? So I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would say yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, everything that touches us and leaves a mark are kind of the big things, right? Pivotal moments in our life, pivotal relationships, and uh, I feel very much marked by my beginnings. Um, and I don't think just because they're unhappy. I mean, home is home. There's just something about you know that that first place, that first family. Um, the, the society that you're surrounded by, the culture, etc. Um, so absolutely, it has an impact. 
impact on my writing and the fact that I'm an immigrant and have now lived in the US longer than I lived in Ireland, that's also shaping my work in ways conscious and unconscious. Um, so yeah, we're, we're revealing ourselves through our work. Um, we're showing ourselves, we're, we're showing um, uh, what, you know, our surroundings, everything touches us, you know, place, people, all of that. Um, and at the end of the day, I, I'm only going to be able to tell the best stories that I can, and that is, you know, with the white aesthetic, regardless, you know, it, it, that's who I am, um, that's where I'm coming from, and I suppose that's somewhat problematic, it's this idea that that's the center, and you're talking about, you know, the, the idea that these stories are universal can be problematic, you know, that idea. But I think every storyteller is trying to get to a truth and, and to show something they believe to be true of particular characters. And, and I find, and I think it's generally accepted, you know, the more specific we are, like this is one character, this is the why of them, the what, et cetera, that it is universal. Like I, I read widely and I read, you know, different walks of life. That's one of the big rewards in reading are these windows that I normally wouldn't have access to into lives. And it's amazing how much resonates. You know, absolutely. So there is so much sameness, but there are unique and important differences. And I think it's it's a bigger picture of widening the canon, you know, sort of Defamiliarizing or decentering the center, um, you know, and allowing for more inclusivity, diversity, etc. Um, and meanwhile, you know, I'll be scribbling away, just trying to do the best I can, you know, with my particular imagination and my particular life experiences. Um, yeah, I think that's. Thank you. As I say, I'm not sure if I interpreted your question right, but. Um, when I was growing up, I feel like this just to date myself. I feel like there were like three to five craft books <laughs> available when I was like 18 or 20, and now there are thousands. Um, but they're all sort of a lot of them are repetitions of the same thing, right? And so I feel like my life as a writer has been. I, I love reading craft books, actually, but they are most of them sort of repetitions on a theme, and I think that's what you're getting at with like the kind of Western um, perspective and and. The thing that has taken that's been good but hard for me is like all this time reading these books, I've been trying to fit myself as a writer into some of these forms that didn't naturally agree with my sort of mental model of a story or how I wanted to tell it. And that mainly revolves around plot and the kind of basic kind of premise or model for a plot, which is usually this triangle that goes up, builds, 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 and then the genuine at the end. And I hate that. None of my stories have ever fit that. I've struggled, to fit, especially for novels. I've spent years trying to get a novel <laughs> to fit into that triangle. And it doesn't work. And, and, I, and, and the thing was and, is that that doesn't have to be the model. I mean, it's kind of put out there as a universal, especially when um, Joseph Campbell came around with the hero of a thousand faces. Everybody's like, oh, there's this one story in it. It's pervasive. It's everywhere. Every, every single story follows this, but actually not, or, it's, or, or variations of that, or the modulations of that, or nuances of it. And so um, on my podcast, I recently interviewed uh, Lydia Yuknovich, and she was also saying that, how much she struggled with that, and how what was liberating for her, it was actually the same thing that was liberating for me. She read this author, Natalie Siro, a French author who wrote this book called Tropisms. Um, I don't think it's, it's kind of little known. I don't know if she's exactly little known, but anyway. Tropisms are these little tiny stories that, that just like have, they, they just follow the smallest little pivot, the smallest little turn. So it's not about a big character change or big journey away. It's about this small little thing. And so Lydia Yuknovich, she put a different language to plot. She said, I write for um, intensities, mm -hmm. you know? And I thought that, that was a beautiful way to put it, you mm -hmm. know? And to write for intensities instead of writing for all this kind of stepladder of mm -hmm. narrative tension. And so for me, it's been, and when you said, um, that you write in snippets with, yeah. with snake, snake <laughs> something snaking them. I mean, that's how I write, and that's how I conceive of a story. And I think like if writing through fragments and with intensities, that's, yes. that's enough plot for me. That's yeah. enough. I mean, for me, it's all about like creating tension. It's mm -hmm. not creating this kind of neat adventure plot, you know? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. No, I, I would totally agree. I, uh, I think I totally agree with both of you. I think that, as you said, Ethel, the more unique and the more specific the more universal uh, 
my mother-in-law, for some reason, lately connects with all things Japanese, <laughs> and uh, she's as French as can be. Uh, and, and you know, why? Why is that? What, what happens? Why do people connect with cultures that are that they've never been exposed to at all? And I think it's, and especially with the short form, uh, it's like an intense bath. You know, in any good story, there's world building. So you're you're going to be seeped into a world that you don't know. Uh, and so it could be somewhere in Japan, it could be Iowa, it could be Dublin. Uh, and, and there's that joy of being uh, exposed and, and bathed into something that you don't know and that you start to formulate in your mind and understand. And so I think in the short form, particularly, that bath has to be super intense. Uh, it's like almost like an acid bath. <laughs> and it's, you know, and you, you get into it, you don't know what to expect, and suddenly this happens, it's super cold. <laughs> or it's very hot. And you, how did that happen? And then you, the story's already over, and it's a, it's a whirlwind. So I think that is, and, and so you aim for intensity and connection. And intensity and connections I would totally agree. It's not something that happens linearly. It's something that happens in fragments because that's how we are built as humans, is little moments, little snippets, little fragments of intensity that suddenly coalesce and into something and maybe snakes into a little story uh, if you're lucky. So so I think that's, that's, that's great. The, the, the other thing I will say is, uh, you know, obviously, yes, uh, my background and my home uh, and the fact that I'm a migrant, I, I, I use this, the word migrant more than immigrant because for me, migrant, there's something that's ongoing. Uh, I, I, there, there's a motion that continues. I'm not arrived. I'm never arrived, and I hope I will never arrive, <laughs> even on my deathbed. Uh, and, and I think the, the short story is a, is, is a form of really rapid migration. Uh, you know, in Europe we say, oh, it's, it's really cool because you, you can take a, a, one of those fast trains and in sort of an hour you're out of Paris and, and to Berlin or uh, Port, Porto or Athens and it's like, wow, uh, it's a completely different language, different architecture, you're like, uh, and, and, and I think the short story does that. It's, it seeps you in that new world super fast and you don't know where you're headed and once it ends, you're like, how did I even get there? And, and so I think that's, that's really what the, the short form allows us to do, is that intensity and in, in that really rapid migration, which I find absolutely delightful. Yeah. Um, Lise, how are we doing for time? Is it uh, time for? We should probably open up yeah. to questions. Um, yeah. And probably have time for just a few questions. And then if people have more, they can go to the bookstore. Cool. So yeah, um, any questions? All right. All right. Go. Yeah, you you were first. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Um, oh, so um, obviously, listening to a story about a woman being killed by a man, you're kind of like your initial instinct is like, here we go again. But then I take a second just to think that um, you know it's it's telling it as it is, opposed to as we want it to be. And I'm just curious as how you kind of make that balance between reflecting very much the world we live in now uh, and the world that we want it to be. Great question. I, I think about it all the time. Yeah. <laughs> what, what do you guys think? The, the, the balance, right, between, yeah, just the reflecting and sort of bringing in your creative imprint in that. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, well, <laughs> I think that is a really, I'm going to be thinking about that question for some time. It's a great question, but I, um, and, and you say that all the time, but I really mean that. I am going to think about that. Um, I think for me, it gets back to, I always find myself writing, you know, very personally about the things that I care deeply about. And that becomes political, right? Because, you know, what, what I care about is are the things that affect me, my family, and our community, um, you know, and then that sort of extrapolates out to the world at large. So it is about holding up a mirror and you're hoping that what you show, like I had a tiny 
clip I was going to read from one of my stories today called Everywhere She Went, and it's about a child abduction. Um, and so I care about that, right? I care about women in, in our society and, and culture and, and issues of misogyny, etc. And, you know, how can I um, make something about that? Like, how can I be the change that I want to see in the world? Um, I think there's only so much story can do, but I would hope that my story on a girl disappearing and, and it never being solved, she's never found, is to invite the reader in to really sort of sit with that and engage with it and think about it. And I like making things strange. I, I like defamiliarizing things. So my hope is that unfortunately this has become a normal story. Like it's normalized that women go missing. Um, and I hope that I hold a mirror up in a way that shows it a little slant, a little differently, so it makes you look and look again, and, and hopefully that it would elicit, first of all, the horror, and then the impulse to act, to do something about it. I don't really know how to answer the question, <laughs> but uh, I, I do, uh, there's some, I forget who said this, and I can't repeat the quote, but it is basically like, why be a writer, why write stories if they're not gonna improve the world somehow, you know, like with there, it is about like change, right? We're supposed to become better. And so there's that, there is that question, does your mode of writing serve that, you know? And I think when you write about something that, that is like horrible in life, but those horrible things happen, I mean, I'm thinking of Ethel said you want to hold up a mirror, right? And that's, I think, our ultimate responsibility is to be a witness to truth. And if we're not serving that, even in its perhaps most distasteful way, we're not doing a service, you know, like somehow, Somehow we have to confront these things, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and there's so many wonderful stories in the world, fortunately, that aren't necessarily about those darker things, you know, that allow more light in. Um, I don't write many of those that do allow the light in, and sometimes I wonder if I should or if that would be a better way to approach things. But um, I like kind of confronting um, those things, I guess, on the page, at least. Yeah, no, I would, I would echo that. I think uh, the responsibility as a writer is to, to get at that emotional truth, whatever that is. Uh, and, and, and so that in and of itself becomes sort of a political act. Uh, you know, I, I don't think along these lines when I write, obviously, because it would uh, probably freeze me in action. Uh, but it's, it's about opening questions. Uh, and, and, and following the questions and leaving the questions unanswered uh, as well, I think is really important. Because, uh, you know, who am I to, to come uh, with answers? The only thing I can do is tap into the questions and maybe open them up and op open them up in a way that is slightly different uh, from, you know, what we hear. And, and then hopefully that, that'll get that'll trickle into other people, read the reader's mind and, and their own questions. But it's something that's, that's opening rather than closing. Uh, and so, you know, even as you explore um, horrible topics or horrible characters, you really have to come at it with an open mind and an open heart and embrace the horrible as well, which is something we can afford with uh, fiction. Uh, we can, um, one of my stories is, is, is an incest story between a brother and a sister, and I really wanted to approach it with no judgment. Who am I to judge these people? If they actually love each other dearly as brother and sister, what is wrong with that? And why do we think it's wrong? And so it's, it's opening up the conversation in ways that uh, engage uh, and, and, and open up a little bit of that mirror and that light and just show things differently and open up more questions. Yeah. It is a striking story. And the one, one thing you show, right, is how much they judge themselves for what they're doing. Because the, the one of the things that stories, I think, do is that they, they also show us sort of that they, they show the places where we inherit judgments from the society. And they, they sh sort of make clear how the society's rules operate on a human being. And I think that's another service perhaps that that the stories that fiction can provide is just the, it 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 makes something it makes it makes an invisible 
invisible social um, contracts or social social um, you know people that we the things that we accept for granted ideas that we accept for granted that make somehow uh, creates a rupture between uh, between the the writer the characters and the reader. Um, so that's yeah, that's a that's a really striking story. I, I loved it. Um, I, I think we maybe have one more yeah. quick quick round of questions. You you in front? Yeah, you, sure. you were first. <laughs> first uh, I would just love to hear more about how the book you talking about uh, the liberation that comes from writing in a second language and <laughs> why do you find uh, you know a certain kind of liberation or the the nature of it and so on. Yeah. Another one your question? Oh, so he was just asking at the very beginning. Um, Cecile was saying that English was her fun language. Toy language. <laughs> toy language. Toy language. <laughs> <laughs> like, and then Olga was agreeing like, that having writing in a second language can free you up. So um, he was just asking about that. Yeah, I think you know writing is on some level uh, is performing. You 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 slip into. A character or multiple characters' skin, uh, or into your narrator's skin if it's third person, then, and, and and you're performing, and you're like trying to see from that angle what's what's going on if I'm in that body, and what's what happens when I feel this and look at this, etc. And I think for me, the when I came to writing, I I I started writing in English. And uh, English came to me sort of late uh, in, my, uh, in my early 20s. And there's something so fun about not using your mother tongue because now you're outside of all those cliches, all those formulations, everything's new. Uh, it's like a kid, you get this massive Lego box and you, every word, is something new, something that sparks, something that pauses questions, because you don't have inherited uh, ideas as to the meaning of each word, the the formulation of sentences, uh, items. Like for me, so I get really overly excited when I come across a new word, and I come across new words all the time because English has, I think, three or four times more words than French, because you know I. I don't know where that comes from, but it's the reality. So my toy box is even bigger. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, I think there's something uh, fabulous. And, and, and also, it, help, it holds myself accountable, right? I, I really have to think more. I have to, and sometimes, you know, my inner snake is a, a, a mush of French and English, and so how do I navigate that? And there's fun. Uh, it's 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 a lot of fun, I think. And and for me, it was really liberating. And and I know there's many writers that that, that have done, you know, that have gone along that journey. And and it is there's something really refreshing and performative. Uh, and and that's part of the part part of the joy. Yeah. Um, I think we should. Yeah. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you all so much. Yeah, I did. Oh, did you guys? Did you want to? Ask? Yeah. Yeah.